you. Thank you, John. Uh, thanks, Tony. Uh, I just had Zoom telling me I'm being recorded. So, <laughs> uh, so look, it's amazing to have so many people here. We have 84 participants, uh, which is fantastic. And this is a real uh, privilege for me. It's been such a journey of discovery in the eight years that I've been involved in Reef Life Survey from, gee, what fish is that, to now being able to do surveys up and down the East Coast and other places. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to do surveys in places like Victoria and Tasmania and over in Ningaloo. Um, so really it's been a wonderful experience and to be able to share what we're finding as a result of many other volunteers like me getting underwater and counting fish and invertebrates. Um, to be able to share that to, with you all today around Melbourne's Port Phillip Bay is really quite something. So I'm, I'm going to attempt the technological challenge of sharing my screen and we'll see how that goes. So hopefully now you can see this magnificent uh, mountain range, which is not the point. Uh, and hopefully now you can see, thumbs up, Tony, the slide. Correct? Okay. Right, so I'll get on with it. Um, so really, I'd like to start by just maybe not all of you are familiar with Reef Life Survey. And so just to sort of tell a little bit of the story, um, Reef Life Survey started about 12 years ago. Um, Gray Medgar, um, Nev and others in, you know, in Tasmania. And they said, can we, is, is it possible for us to train up dedicated, uh, committed, volunteers to a level that equals the scientist underwater doing surveys. And the answer to that question was yes, they found that it was possible. And so Reef Life Survey has been a great success story from that day uh, in Tasmania. It's now in over 50 countries of the world. Um, over 13,000 surveys have been completed, three and a half thousand sites, which is incredible. And you need, you need that sort of scale to answer questions around the big issues that we face today. If you're going to ask a question around climate change or big marine protected areas, you can't answer that without huge data sets like this. So this has enabled us to really um, understand what's going on under the water much better than we've been able to in the past. But it does depend on a different style of engagement. A lot of citizen science programs try to engage lots of people Whereas RLS goes the other way and say, let's find those handful of people in, in an area that are really committed and are prepared to throw a lot of energy into this and get trained up. And, and so focus on a smaller number of divers, but collecting very high quality data. And a result of, as a result of that, Reef Life Survey's been able to build this huge data set, which is, is today informing management decisions around the world on how we manage our oceans. And so it really is quite something to be part of it. So what do we mean by a reef life survey? Well, we, I'm going to, I'll be doing one again on Saturday uh, here in Sydney um, and we do them all year round. And we also focus on certain areas at certain times of the year. But once we get out there, we pretty much always the same pattern. We'd run a 50 meter transect along the bottom and it's always on rocky reef or coral reef. We try to avoid sand. And while that tape is in place, we swim along and we count all the fish species that we see, their abundance and we, and we also record their size. We then do what we call method two, which is looking at a, a narrower band along the bottom and recording uh, mobile macro invertebrates. So basically invertebrates that are big enough and that move things like starfish and crabs and urchins. And we also count small cryptic fish, the ones that we didn't record on the first pass when we were looking up in the water column. And then finally, we take 20 photographs of the bottom and that's used to then assess things like a degree of kelp cover. So it's quite a thorough record of what's happening along that 50 metre transect. Now, RLS started 12 years ago, and in the first year or two of the, its foundation, they said, hey, let's do something pretty ambitious. Let's go all the way around Australia and survey as many sites as we can. So that initial lap of Australia in 2010 created and recorded 800 plus sites. 
And today there's over two and a half times that around Australia. Um, but now 10 years later, the, the big push that we're undertaking, thanks to funding from the Ian Potter Foundation and others, is we're revisiting those 800 sites and surveying them, some of them for the first time in that 10 year period. Others, of course, we've been doing every year since. And that allows us to say, well, let's look at what's changed in the last decade. And big um, ambitious projects like this and big scale data sets allow us to draw big conclusions. And so I'll just show you a couple of the big conclusions that we've been making in recent years with RLS. And the reason for that is this sort of gives you some of the background to what's happening in Port Phillip Bay. So for example, a big study looking at um, several hundred, I think it's up around a thousand sites around the world in 2014, um, published by Reef Life Survey scientists and others, found that um, we've pretty much depleted the oceans of about two thirds of their fish biomass um, over the course of history. Um, and that's using highly protected areas as the benchmark of what good is. Um, but we've, we've particularly depleted the biggest fish, including um, in this case sharks by over 90%. So we really are having a big effect on our oceans. And in Australia, we're not immune from that. So another study found that we've um, seen fish stocks decline by 30% over the last decade around all of Australia. There's another part of the sort of big picture story I want to mention before we then dive into Port Phillip Bay, and that is climate change and the effect it's having on particularly the forests of the ocean. So in temperate waters, kelp is really the, 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 big, the big forest that provides the shell habitat and, and the photosynthesis that drives a lot of the system. And kelp likes cool water with a lot of nutrients. Climate change is, is shifting to warmer water um, often nutrient poor water. And so current projections are that we'll lose most of the kelp out of northern New South Wales by the end of this century. And another big study, uh, not using RLS data, but using things like aerial photographs of Port Phillip Bay found that since the 1930s, kelp has declined by up to 98% in some places, maybe 50% in others. So there are multiple studies showing there are these really large scale impacts going on relating particularly to climate change. So that's important backdrop to what we're seeing in Port Phillip Bay. So let's now dive under the bay. Um, one of my favorite critters, uh, I love the piers in Port Phillip Bay, amazing places to explore and the color and life under them is incredible. Um, and here's a crab um, underneath the pier, it's probably Blair Gowry or something. So in Port Phillip Bay itself, um, We've actually, well, RLS has been doing surveys since 2008, but it was based on a survey method that was actually being performed in the Bay long before then. Um, so uh, since 1998, surveys are being done uh, as part of the Australian Temperate Reef Collaboration and Parks Vic. But then in 2008, the RLS um, organisation started taking on those surveys. So as a result of that long history, there's been over 1500 surveys done in the Bay all the way around 81 sites. Um, and you can see that there are some gaps and that's because uh, we only ever survey on rocky reef or hard reef surface. So wherever there's sandy bays, for example, you won't get a site. So as a result of that, I'm now gonna talk about what we're seeing in terms of fish and invertebrates and algae. Um, first of all, fish. So uh, this is fish species richness. This is the number of different species of fish we see on a given transect, okay? So whether there's one individual or a hundred, it's, it's one species. So up the top right, you can see um, the three fish that are most commonly recorded. So they're on more transects than others. Uh, that's not saying there are a lot of them in terms of abundance, but they're widespread. So the blue throat wrasse, the Victorian scaly fin and the zebra fish. So a lot of the data you're looking at here is, uh, contains um, those fish. Uh, you can see though, if you look at the left plot um, of the bay, the darker blue is only a couple of species being found on that 50 meter transect. And the greener and yellower colors are then maybe 10, 15 species on a transect. You can see straight away there's a pattern, which is 
less fish species in the north of the bay, more in the south, particularly around the entrance to the bay, around the heads. In fact, we typically see um, one or two or three species in the entire survey on a 50 metre transect up in the north, whereas we'll see 10 to 15 species on a transect in the south. The site that has the most species is that lime green dot near the entrance, that's Pope's Eye, on average 16 fish species on a transect. So that's quite a good number of fish, quite a good diversity of fish. And then in the right hand plot, you can see the change over the last decades. So the left plot is the last three years on average. The right hand plot is what's changed to, to end up with that left hand situation. So you can see that not only do we have less species in the north, but there the, that's where the declines have been happening. So that makes sense, really. But it does say that 10 years ago, we would have had maybe eight or 10 species on a transect in the north. Now we're getting two or three. Whereas down in the south, we actually are seeing some in increases in fish. So not only are there more fish down south, there are increasing numbers of species down south. So the, up in the north, that's, that's most likely related to habitat, which I'm going to come to in, in coming slides. Um, whereas down the south, you've got more fish down there. The water is a different uh, quality. It's highly flushed. It's coming in and out the heads. Uh, whereas up in the in the northern part of the bay, it doesn't get the same degree of flushing. You've also got more wave energy and more action down in that in those southern parts of the bay. So just hold that thought for the moment, and we'll start to see as we look at some of the other slides what might be driving some of this. So that's number of species. The other thing we can look at because we count the fish and we also look at their size, we can calculate their biomass. So what about if we look at not the number of species, but just the total weight of fish on a transect? How many kilos of fish do we record on a transect? Well, it's much the same. Uh, very low biomass in the north. In fact, some sites have zero biomass. That's rounded to the nearest kilo. So that's less than half a kilo of fish over uh, a 50 metre by 10 metre, so 500 square metres of reef. That's very, very low. Um, whereas down in the south, you can see much higher biomass numbers. Um, and so it's a similar pattern, um, not only less species in the north, but less biomass, um, and maybe driven by similar things, those sort of southern locations having uh, more, um, uh, you know, the water coming in and out, they're, they're deeper, they're more flushed and so on. You also get some little anomalies, and this is something that, um, we'll see happening on a couple of the other plots. Every now and then there's a site that has this like different result. So for example, you can see this green, lime green, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this lime green um, here, which is a site that's just got an awful lot of fish. Well, that can be simply down to um, on one particular year we recorded, in this case, lots of stingarees that were just hanging around that wreck, which is the PS ozone wreck. And so that's enough to give a big um, lump of biomass in the data and so give you that sort of anomaly. So that's why you've got some sites that are showing big and small. So it's best to look at these plots in terms of the overall patterns, north versus south and so on, rather than focus too much on the, um, on the dots. I looked up this one here too. See this really big decline in biomass? And um, you look, hey, what's going on? Because there's a lot of fish biomass down around the heads. Why did one site have this big decline? Well, that was because there was a huge smooth stingray. You see this one up here, the smooth stingray. They grow to 350 kilos. So one of those was recorded on transect in 2009. And so over the 10 years, because it wasn't there 10 years later, we had a big decline in, in the biomass because we just didn't see the same stingray. So there are some of those, just a little bit of caution in terms of paying too much attention to individual sites. So that's the fish situation. What about invertebrates? Well, the invertebrate story is almost going the other way around. So here you can see the colours are the numbers of invertebrate species, and you can see the yellow is more and the dark blue is less. You can see that we've got, as opposed to fish, we've got more species of invertebrates in the north and actually perhaps even increasing in the north. Whereas down south, we've got less species uh, and also more signs of decline. 
So that could be something as simple as um, fish are often predators of invertebrates. So more fish down south and around the heads, more predators eating the um, urchins and other invertebrates, and therefore we're seeing um, less invertebrates here as a consequence of that. The three most widely recorded invertebrates, to give you an idea of what we're talking about, uh, are these three up the top, the biscuit sea star, the purple urchin, and the black lip black lip abalone. Um, so once again, not so much abundance, but that's in order of um, the ones that are on the most transects. Uh, once again, a bit of an anomaly here, this red dot, what happened? Well, early on in the 10 years, we just got a lot of nudibranchs under Blair Gowrie Pier, and they weren't being recorded 10 years later. So that's another one of those little anomalies in the data set. Now, another thing to think about with some of this, this invertebrate story and the kelp story, which we're coming to is uh, another thing that's happening in the bay is we do dredging and the dredging changes the water flows and that can move sand around. And so a site might have reef one year and then it might be inundated with sand the next year, maybe related to dredging. And so sometimes that'll change our data around because we go to lay the transect and there's all of a sudden there's sand where there used to be a reef. So we'll have to move it a bit. So there's a little bit of that um, coming out in these results as well. But the general story there is um, almost the inverse of the fish story. So when we look at invertebrates, um, rather than just treat them as one group, we, we thought it might be nice to break them up into a couple of categories uh, because there's, there's one particular category of invertebrate that's having a really big effect on the bay. Uh, and there's another one which is almost um, the affected party. Um, so let's look now at sea stars. This is really, uh, one way to think of sea stars is, um, in, in a way they're being affected by some other things that are going on. Um, so once again, we see more sea stars in the north. So that sort of looks all right. These are those um, sites. This is Brighton um, over here, uh, Long Reef, and this is Avalon and so on. This is uh, Williamstown. So you can see, you know, quite good numbers of sea stars and that's pretty much or mostly this cushion star up here, um, um, Meridiasa calcar. Um, and that looks all right, except when you look over here and you say, well, actually, even though there are a lot of sea stars, they've been declining. So there would have been a lot more 10 years ago. So even though today we're still getting them, we would have got even more 10 years ago. So there's something happening to the sea stars, particularly over here in the western side of the bay. Okay. And, and one possible explanation for that is that they might be being outcompeted by urchins. Um, so the urchin story is driving a lot of um, what's happening in the north in particular. So in Port Phillip Bay, there's one urchin species that really is the super abundant one, which is this one, the purple urchin, Heliosaurus erythrogramma. And whilst there are a few other species, it's really very much this one here that's in the numbers. And you can see huge numbers of this urchin um, in the northern parts of the bay, you know, thousands of urchins on one transect. In fact, in the highest density in, in a given survey, we might get 50 urchins on one square metre. Uh, it's averaging around 25, but some surveys we get 50. So there's a massive explosion of these purple urchins. Um, now, of course, they've always been part of the ecology of the bay as far as we know, but um, they do, uh, they are enjoying boom times at the moment. And they are aggressive herbivores. They, they eat kelp and so um, lots of urchins means less kelp um, and also less of other species that are competing with them for space. Okay, so the, you've got to live Somewhere you've got to find a patch of rock and if there's an urchin living there, you don't have the sea stars living there. And so you can see the um, huge growth of urchins, particularly over here in the west and northwest of the bay. But you can see a nice, much less in terms of urchin abundance down in the south. And that we, we suspect that's pretty much the um, predation story with fish eating them. But also down here in the south, you've got more kelp and the movement of the kelp is enough to discourage urchins or dislodge them perhaps. And also 
Um, the wave action, you know, these urchins don't like to be knocked around by wave action. So there, there are um, geological factors as well as biological factors coming in there. And the final piece of the puzzle in my last slide is therefore, what does this all mean to those forests of the ocean, the kelp? Uh, and really the story is um, that over the whole of the bay, kelp is declining. There's a lot more orange and red here um, than there is blue. Um, and so this is a concern because these are the forests. We're losing the forests that are under the water here in the bay. And you might say, well, that's not too bad, right? We've got 10, 20, 30% cover, even in the worst sites. But remember, we're only seeing sites that are rocky reef. All of this sand, all this sand area, oops, huh. um, let me go back up. Um, all of these sandy areas here that aren't reef, they won't have kelp either because kelp grows on reef. And so even though we're getting 10 to 20, 30% over, over the whole bay on the reef, that would be a much lower percentage in terms of the whole bay. Um, the one place, well, the big, the big place where that's a bit of an exception is down here. We get lots of nice wave action. This is actually outside the bay, outside Point Lonsdale. Lots of nice wave action, um, nice clean water and other factors that help the kelp to thrive and, and stave off those urchin barren pressures that we're seeing much more in the north. And the one last thing I thought I might point out, you might say, well, hang on, there's a site here inside the bay that's had this really nice expansion of kelp. What, is this like a good news story? We thought it might have been, and then we looked at it, and this, this plot is large canopy forming algae. So it's not just the common native kelp, it's all types of kelp. And this was actually uh, a year when they had a lot of invasive kelp, the Japanese Undaria kelp. Um, moved into this area and took over a large area. So even though there was a lot of kelp, <laughs> it wasn't the sort of kelp that we want to see in the bay. Um, so generally the kelp story is one of concern um, driven by those factors that I mentioned, the warming, uh, drier climate and the urchin barrens and the urchins being released from predation by the low numbers of fish in the bay. So um, that's as far as the overview of what we're seeing, the patterns in the data, I'm now going to hand to Rick because um, you don't need to wait till the next time we do this webinar to look at some of this stuff. There's the possibility in the future you might be able to look at some of it for yourself. So I think I've handed back. So have you got the Reef Life Explorer? Okay, so um, as John said, um, this, this is uh, something you'll be able to look at yourself uh, very soon. It's pretty exciting to have this close to launch. Um, so what you're getting today is just a very quick preview of a new online tool that we've been developing. Well, it's been a work in progress since RLS started, but really the last, the last year it's been evolving rapidly and uh, certainly um, helped by funding from the Port Phillip Bay Fund and uh, uh, also combined with a WA um, project. So that have helped put this together and a lot of work from, from RLS team here and also Chris Brown uh, at Griffith Uni. So basically what this is, is um, an interactive data platform. It allows you to explore the trends in the RLS data. It's all of the RLS data that are collected plus all of the long-term uh, monitoring data from the ATRC going back 30 years. So the intro is actually really cool and you'll, you'll look forward, I encourage you to go through the intro when, when this is released. So the release date is the 4th of, of uh, December, which I think is next, is Friday week. Uh, and so please keep your eyes out for the release and uh, make sure you go through this intro when, um, when it's released. I'll go straight to the, to the tool now though. And uh, it just takes a little while to load up. Um, it just has to wait for people to collect the data. So uh, this, when you come in, there's three type, three different maps here. The first one's very much just a regional overview. And it basically it allows you to look at three 
three key metrics here on the left, three indicators of general reef, reef health. And it's just a, um, a spatial comparison between regions that have been surveyed by Reef Life Survey. But the more exciting stuff is actually in these next two tabs, the indicator heat map and location time series in the right. So with the indicator heat maps, you can select from, from more indicators. We will be adding to these through the future. We have a couple of others lined up to add. But uh, here are some examples, the large reef fish. This is, this is a heat map of all RLS data. So it's not modeled to areas that haven't been surveyed, but there is a buffer around all of the survey sites. And this is the biomass of fish 20 centimeters and over recorded on, on reefs. And I'm not sure if you can see here in the top right, there's, as you hover over it, it has the, the values, the interpolated values between the sites. So that's the gradient in, in fish biomass over 20 centimetres on um, all of the survey sites and TC hotspots, places like the Kermadec Islands. Uh, there's a number of things here that the fish species richness is something that John just showed for Port Phillip Bay. And that shows the gradient with the highest values here in, around in uh, Eastern Indonesia. But so I encourage you to play around and have a look at, at all of those. There's some really interesting patterns that show up and um, some surprises if, if you're not familiar with the distribution of biodiversity around, around the world. But something perhaps more re relevant today here is if when you click on the location time series, all of these pink pins that show up are places where we have uh, more than three years worth of monitoring data for a particular set of sites. Um, and so, there are more of these that will be showing up in the next year or two as a third lot of surveys gets done around the remote parts of the coast and especially GBR and Coral Sea should be coming online early in the new year. But drilling into Port Phillip, the focus of today's webinar, um, you could click, we've separated the bay and the heads. They're quite different as John showed in terms of the trends. And so, here we have the, on the bottom, you can see the trend in species richness of fish uh, through time. And this actually goes right back to the start of the data from the, uh, when it was started by um, Neville and Graham before being taken on by the Parks Victoria um, contractors. Uh, so you can, if you click on the, the years along here, you can actually get a heat map for the distribution of reef fish species richness among sites in, that, in any given year. So you can explore for, you, for yourself and see the, the trend. So the, the what most was 2018 in this area. And uh, we can go to the invertebrate species. We saw John had some of those trends and John was showing just the start versus the end uh, in time. This allows you to look at the actual trend through time. So it's actually really quite, um, it, there's a lot of depth to this. You can, you can be exploring for a long time and still be finding new things. Uh, and likewise, if you click on the Port Phillip Bay, uh, you can see that and we should be able to look at the, um, the urchins there that we were, we were talking about and you can see the increase through time and you can see the hotspots and even back at the start of the RLS monitoring, um, you can see that those hotspots there with 675 up if you look in the top right corner or 700 urchins per 50 metre squared block. So, uh, and also to note that there's these values here are the, are the min, min and max of the observed values. Whereas this trend here is, is a model, it's a GAM uh, model that's fit through the data that accounts for imbalanced surveys between different years and things. So it's a bit more statistically defensible, but the raw values are up there. Uh, you can also download the data. So the budding, for the scientists out there who actually wanna use the, the raw information and do their own modeling, uh, you can, if you click on that, you can download the data for all of those indicators just calculated for each survey through that period. So it provides access to the raw data, the trends through time and visualization of the trends through time on the heat maps. Uh, and yeah, it's only gonna get better as more and more data are added. So um, it will be planted as a long-term live um, product that will continually be updated with new data and we'll see this cumulative number of um, surveys uh, increase. You can see here the heads, huge number of surveys there through time. So keep your eyes open for, 
on the 4th of December for the announcement when this goes live and you'll be able to access it through the Reef Life Survey website. Uh, so to finish up, I, we're about to go to some questions, but um, I did want to thank the, the particular funders of the work in Port Phillip, which includes DELP and uh, the Port Phillip Bay Fund specifically, uh, who have provided the, um, the resources to finish the surveys over the last few years and to, to build that online platform. Uh, Parks Victoria, who obviously been supporting the, the surveys in, in and around all of Victoria for the last 20 years or so, uh, or more, and the Ian Potter Foundation. Uh, there's also a lot of other supporters that aren't mentioned here, and some of them have shown on that um, Reef Life Explorer tool and also on the Reef Life Survey website. There's um, obviously the work of the volunteers that goes into collecting the data that allow all of that to be shown and the presentation today and everything that comes out of RLS comes from, from that hard effort underwater. So I'll, I'll pass back to Tony, and I think she's going to uh, dish out some questions. Yeah, thanks, John and Rick. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. We're already getting some really great feedback uh, coming in through the chat. Everyone's really excited for the uh, Reef Life Explorer tool coming out next Friday. So be sure to keep an eye out for, for when that happens. We'll be posting online. So uh, please have a look and, and get in touch if you've got any questions. Um, but for now, um, our questions are focused around the Port Phillip Bay presentation. So um, Rick, the first one I'll, I'll flag to you. Um, we've got a question asking whether or not um, you can recommend any good field guides for fishes in Southeast Australia? <laughs> it sounds like a set up question, but uh, if yeah, it's not, not okay, well, the, the number one resource, I might have to share my screen again, if you don't mind. Um, the number yeah, one resource it. we can recommend for, for reef species would be going to the Reef Life Survey website, which uh, if you go to, um, bear with me uh, on, the internet connection. If you go to the Reef Life Survey website, reeflifesurvey.com, and go to the Reef Species of the World tab and search species. Uh, so where were they interested, Tony? Where was the question? Let, let's okay. do Port Phillip Bay, um, hey? So you can zoom in on the map and you can draw a box around Port Phillip Bay. And are we interested in fish or invertebrates or any family? I'll just search everything. Uh, you can actually subset the search by these fields or you can type in a family name or... Um, but if you just search for everything in that box, it comes up with all of the species that have been recorded by on these surveys uh, at all of those sites. So there's 299 species covered here. Um, you can actually sort by the frequency within that box. So this will tell you the, the um, most common species first. So, and as John mentioned, these ones that showed up in his, um, in his presentation in the results. And so you can actually, if you just want to scan through images, um, you can select three or, or six images and see the adults, you know, the male, female, juvenile, and, and so on. But if you actually want to then see, uh, if you click on the name of the species, it tells, it has a number of images there that you can scroll through to see the different stages and different appearance. So not many people would know that that little green ras, a purple ras can look similar to that too, but is a blue throat and you can see the distribution of the species and there's other information yeah, kind of there, similar species that you might get it confused with or closely related ones in the genus. So this is a fantastic resource. There's, there's lots more to it, even the frequency explorer and there's a lot, it requires some exploration. And the compare species yeah, function um, too. I, I won't, I won't go into it all now, yeah. but um, please feel free to drop, drop us a line and, um, and someone would be happy to, uh, to run you through how to use this if you're not sure how to get the best out of it. But in terms of other field guide books, there are there's, there's a lot of good books out there as well. And if the people, and apps as well, um, there's Rudy Cooter's books. Um, we, we can provide a list on um, by email if, if you email in that question and, and they're keen on books. But uh, yeah, but this, this resource on the web is pretty good. We've got a new tool being developed for that where you can actually um, export those results to a PDF as well. Thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, so as Rick said, if anyone has any questions about how to use that um, reef species of the world search uh, species tool, then please just get in contact at inquiries at reeflifesurvey.com um, and we can definitely help you out there. 
Um, so we've got another question, um, maybe, uh, John, do you want to answer this one? How long does it take to do a 50 metre transect? I know this is going to be quite variable depending on the location that you're surveying, but um, yeah. you might be able to give us some. It's one of those piece of string answers, I'm afraid, but um, it's a very different story in the tropics where you might get um, 50, 60, 80 species of fish, even more. I think the record is 100 and something uh, species on one transect. 148, John. And it, probably your probably your record is it Rick <laughs> um, so yes yeah, so it takes a lot longer to do a tropical survey we, we we have two divers in the water so you've got your dive buddy nearby and if you if you're in a temperate site um, in Sydney we normally would take about half an hour with those two divers um, in in the site where you had even less fish uh, in those northern sites in the bay I can imagine you'd come in under a hun under that half an hour, it does take a certain amount of time just because you don't want to swim at high, very different speeds. Um, so you still try to swim slowly, and when you're searching the bottom, you're always going to move at a similar speed. But then there's more time involved than when you're having to stop and write with more species. So between half an hour and an, and an hour probably is a reasonable answer. That's for a buddy survey, isn't it, John? Yeah, that's for so your, your buddy's doing the other half of the transect. Yeah. Yeah. So a full 50 metre transect is usually close to that, you know, that 40, to an, 40 minutes to an hour if you, if you do the whole lot. But as a buddy, yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Jackie, I've uh, got a question from David that you might be able to help out with. Uh, are any of the RLS sites the same as the Long Term Parks Vic subtitle reef monitoring sites? And how many of the, of the RLS sites? Um, are reflected in the data? Um, the short answer to that one is um, they're all based on the uh, original site. So we've, all, we've continued all of them, particularly at Port Phillip Heads as part of this um, big Port Phillip Bay fund grant. There was some amazing efforts by uh, the volunteers and from the Reef Life Survey team and the Deakin Dive team and some of the Parks Vic staff as well to try and get all those done the most recent lot. But as far as how many of the sites in Port Phillip Bay long-term ones I wouldn't be able to tell you off the top of my head because 14 inside and four outside thank you <laughs> well, no, we've got lots of piers and jetties and stuff too in the um yeah. in the mix that aren't in the parks but yeah yeah we definitely have a bunch of other RLS sites that exist around the bay as you've seen but um yeah those those 14 core um inside long-term sites and then the four outside but then you guys also um have a bunch of other core long-term monitoring sites around Victoria generally, don't you? Yeah, yeah, so around Point Addis, um, Wilson's Prom, and fingers crossed, next on the list um, after this year's unfortunate early events, um, hopefully we'll get out to Cape Howe and get some, get some good data. Yeah, so. nice. Um, Scott, um, we've got a question uh, from John ask, um, well, saying that, um, He's impressed with the fascinating data, which is great. Um, and it's data that the general community don't often get to see. Uh, what are your thoughts on residential housing developments and stormwater impacts on the Bellarine and St Leonard's area and Port Arlington? Do you have any comments? Yeah, so that's, that's a really interesting question. And that's um, the, the impact of pollution in Port Phillip Bay is obviously a really big threat. So Port Phillip Bay is quite a large, shallow um, body of water. And so the big threat there is always that the whole system could just go belly up and you can get fish kills because you're pumping too much nutrients in there. You've got sort of four and a half million people living around the bay. So the, the threat of pollution is a big one. Um, and we had some funding through Delwa, um, so the Victorian state government uh, back in the mid to, uh, so 2012 to about 2015. And, and we were actually looking at the, trying to collapse the reef systems by increasing nutrients and sediments. And so we're trying to load these reef systems up and really to our surprise, we found it very difficult to get big impacts through nutrients and sediments, even when we're adding, you know, kilos of this stuff to, to the reef. And basically, if you had an intact kelp bed, the kelp bed would just stand up and, and, and continue on, even if you're pumping these pollutants in there. And what we really learned all about the Port Phillip Bay system is that the sea urchin is king. Um, if you had the sea urchin in high numbers that 
overgraze the kelp bed, that's when you would start seeing impacts of sediments and nutrients on the reef. So you could get this overgrazing occurring, knock the kelp away down, and then you could get filamentous turf that would trap the sediment, and, and you'd basically get this crud that developed over the reef. And so that's when we saw these really big impacts is um, these knock-on effects of pollutants once the urchins had removed the kelp. But without that urchin effect, we, we found that the, the, the kelp bed system systems were remarkably resistant or resilient against some of those other pollutants. So yeah, the, the story, the key learning was that we really need to do, do something about the sea urchins and the whole system can be a bit more robust against those other pollutant effects. Mm. So yeah, following on from that then, Scott, um, how has water quality had an impact on the reef sites throughout the bay in the last 10 years, do you think? Uh, yeah, so I guess that was part of this, the study as well. We were we were um, looking at water quality. Um, we found that probably temperature was the biggest water quality issue, if you like. Um, once we got temperatures in the height of summer over about 24 degrees for a few days, we started to see the the, the clonia, the, the kelp, the clonia radiata kelp actually really start to suffer. Um, and that was particularly at, at sort of height of summer when there wasn't a lot of water movement. So I guess water quality is the, 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 the temperature is a big part of the water quality. Um, there are fish kills occasionally there, but if we're just talking about the reefs today, um, we saw that um, you know the reefs were fairly resilient to, to a lot of the other stresses, which is a really fortunate thing. Otherwise, Port Phillip Bay would just collapse. I mean, a lot of the sewage goes into Port Phillip Bay through through the Werribee treatment plant. It is treated, so it's not raw sewage, but um, it, the system is a, a bit of, on a bit of a knife edge. And I'd say of all the diving I've done all over the place, Port Phillip Bay reefs are probably the most dynamic. You'll dive there one month, you'll go back a month later and the whole thing has bloomed or urchins have come in. It's just one of the most dynamic reefs you'll, systems you'll ever uh, come across. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I definitely agree with that. Thanks, Scott. Um, so Jackie, are there any studies on seagrass coverage in the bay and changes in fish numbers due to that? Um, there have been in the past, uh, mostly done um, when Fisheries Victoria did a lot of research and there was a big seagrass study done in previous years and lots of different researchers work on them, but I don't know that it's a such a coordinated effort. It's been a bit more in recent years where there's been some funding in the um, TNC's Mapping Ocean Wealth. Mm. project looked a bit at that to do with seagrass and salt marsh and mangroves and all those sorts of things but yeah okay it's and the same kind as reef life yeah okay and have you seen from those studies were there any changes in fish numbers due to the due to seagrass oh, i'd have to go back and, and have a bit of a look i'm not so uh good with my off the top of the head, seagrass fish number knowledge. <laughs> Might just come back to that one, sure. Yep. Um, so Rick, we're getting lots of questions on the Reef Life Explorer. Um, Spencer wants to know if the RLE includes data from the GBR Marine Park Authority. Um, and also Trevor wants to know whether or not the Explorer is free and if it can be distributed to schools. Um, yeah, so do you wanna? Sure, um, I guess the first thing to say is yes, of course, of course it's free. It's, uh, it's launching on the 4th of December, so don't worry about looking for it until the 4th, but that's uh, just Friday week. It's not far away uh, and it's free and it'll be publicly available for everyone. And we would love it if schools get on board and have a look and download the data and have a play around themselves. That'd be fantastic. Um, also, um, and spread the word, um, please share it amongst your friends and contacts. Uh, in terms of the Great Barrier Reef data, um, so no is the, the simple answer to that. And the reason is because all of these indicators, or a lot of the ones we calculate, have rely on the data being collected using the exact same method to be comparable. So to track the trends through time and space, it's using the same method. So uh, because of that, it's only the reef life survey data combined with the long-term temperate reef monitoring program, the ATRC it's called, that, um, that originate, RLS originated from. And that does include the Parks Victoria historical monitoring as well. So uh, it's anyone that uses that exact same methods around Australia with publicly available data would be we'd be willing to you know talk hear from. But we we're pretty well engaged with those teams and we work with the the um, AIMS long term monitoring for the GBR and uh, yeah. So, so the data the methods that they use aren't quite the same. They're similar but not quite the same. And so we don't have their data in for the GBR, but we have a lot of data for the GBR and soon 
the trends will be up there, but um, we have a lot of spatial data for the GBR and for the Coral Sea uh, and for the remote parts of the Northwest too, and it's all comparable. Great, thank you. And so um, then I guess Rick and John, you guys might be able to help out here. So we've got some questions. Sharon and Spencer both ask how they can get involved with Reef Life Survey. Uh, yeah, look, it's, uh, it's very much um, uh, something that I would highly recommend for cer certain types of people. Um, so if, if you want to dabble and be involved in lots of different programs and stuff, we typically find that it, it doesn't suit because it really takes a lot of dedication of getting trained up. Um, I, I do the Sydney side, not the Melbourne side, but it'll take eight to 10 dives typically for a person who's really committed, spending time looking up all the species in books to get to a level of certification. Um, and then after that, the lights turn on, right? After that you go, wow, every time I go diving, I even look my same old sites, I see, I see a lot more because I can identify everything. So that's the sort of person that should get involved. And, and we, we often, when you, when you approach us, we ask some questions about, you know, what are you interested in and so on to make sure that, uh, you know, it's, it suits. Um, but then in that case, it's simply a matter of making contact with RLS. You can contact us through the website and, and register your interest and say, hey, I'm interested in this. Uh, and then we put you in touch with the local um, trainer or the local people. Uh, and we have trainers now in a number of places, whereas a few years ago, it would have meant waiting until the RLS team sort of came by later in the year. Whereas um, often now, if you're in a major city, for example, there'll be someone who can uh, get you involved and start training you. So the first step is, I'd say, go onto RLS website, have a good look at it, um, download the methods manual, get a sense for what's involved. And then if you say to yourself, yeah, I'm really prepared to get involved in this, I'm keen to give the time to make a difference, then contact us through the website. Yeah, and in addition to that, we do have some, some you know, specific regulations around experience and all that sort of thing, especially in Port Phillip Bay, given the um, slightly different environment, having the quite high currents and tide flow. Um, but yeah, definitely send us an email if you are interested. Again, it's inquiries at reeflifesurvey.com and yeah, we can give you a heap more information. Thanks, John. Um, Scott, we've got a question asking, what is the long-term solution to the sea urchin issue? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And um, <clears throat> not only are we seeing their abundance increase, but when we've done studies on their age structure, we can sort of see that their population dynamic is one that's trending up as well. So we expect more and more through time. So <clears throat> how do we deal with this? Well, some of the experiments we have run show that, again, if you have a healthy kelp bed to begin with, you have much higher predation on little sea urchins that we tether out and, and, and track through an experiment. So there are micro predators that live in the kelp beds that aren't on the barrens. So battling uh, the urchin is all about trying to uh, reduce their numbers to the point where you can get kelp to recover. And then hopefully on the other side is, is not allowing their numbers to build up in the kelp beds in the first place. So they're kind of, <laughs> there are two processes here. And we know this ounce of prevention can be worth a ton of cure. So preventing it the kelp bed collapsing in the first place is, is the key. So, but where, where you do get really vast numbers of urchins, um, if their row quality is okay, then you can harvest them and humans can eat the row and the, the rows is the gonad, which is um, quite lucrative. But unfortunately, the, the row of the urchin on these vast urchin barrens where they're the biggest problem uh, is not very good at all. So you can't really harvest in those areas. In those areas where we have super high numbers of them and up to hundreds per square metre, um, there has been approaches that have been used overseas quite effectively where you can actually um, add quick lime. So the lime like you use on sporting fields can actually burn a hole in, in the sea urchin test and, and make them vulnerable to, to further disease. Um, and, and also um, it, it will just kill them directly. We do see some disease in the Port Phillip Bay uh, urchin populations and makes the urchins a little bit different to other urchin populations around Australia. But um, <clears throat> so you do see the disease killing the, the older individuals, um, but not really affecting the overall population dynamic of, of the urchin. So really, um, yeah, it's, 
in terms of the interventions, you've got to hit them really hard where they're very vast uh, in, in abundance to actually get them below a point where the kelp can recover. Once you do get kelp recovery, it's, it's easy to keep a lid on urchin numbers, but basically you need very strong management intervention. Um, we do know that having more predators in the system and perhaps historically there, there were things like Southern rock lobsters in Port Phillip Bay that you just don't see now, like they're functionally and, and virtually extinct in Port Phillip Bay. So historically, maybe there were a lot more predators in the system. Um, things like snapper are also urchin predators. So building the resilience of the system by having more predators um, there to begin with and reducing other impacts is, is important as well. But a lot of the bay, like 70% of it, in the internal part of the bay is urchin barren. So it's a very vast uh, issue in that bay. And I, I guess it's about trying to um, pick the battles and win some, some territory in some smaller areas to begin with. Uh, can I chip in there? Just um, that that's a great message from Scott there. Just be careful that people can play a role in part of that, and that's the rebuilding the predators part. They they probably shouldn't play a role, try and take it into their own hands to to knock them on the head like like Scott was saying. So that's a, a management intervention required there, not a general public intervention. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm not sure if we've got uh, Dan on the line. I'm not sure if you have a decent enough connection, Dan, but just wondering what, I mean, you've done years and years of, of work in the Bay. Uh, just wondering what your, what the most significant change you've observed, um, if you can hear me. I'm still on mute, I'll try and unmute him. Hello, everyone. Uh, hey, there he is. <laughs> can you hear me? Um, I'm off the coast of Gippsland at the moment, and I've got a very scrappy connection. But um, yeah, look, we've been engaged in um, some monitoring programs in the bay for some years now and diving with Reef Life Survey for the past five. And it's really, really interesting when you look back to those historical records from the Edgar days through to, you know, the consultants that were working for Parks Victoria to the most recent sort of five years of data and I suppose you know that kelp stories um, particularly the loss of say giant kelp in places like Pope's of Andaria, um, not just in the north of the bay we've actually uh, seen on Oh no Area, places like Pope's Eye and Portsea Hole that you know haven't been reported um, previously only in the past couple of years so that's a bit greenly bubbling um, abundance in in the probably going really well um, so that's a good news story but yeah look there is change in Port Phillip Bay um, the biodiversity values we still have population really right at the doorstep Great, thanks, Dan. I think it cut in and out a bit there, but basically to summarise, he was mentioning that um, as a result of these surveys and consistent monitoring, we're also observing um, some new sites that have um, undaria presence, um, but in good news, we're also noticing an increase in some in the greenleaf abalone inside the bay as well. So um, thanks heaps, Dan. Um, We've got another question. Uh, Rick, maybe you're probably the best one for this one. Uh, Sharon wants to know if there have been many papers written using Reef Life Survey data. Uh, using Reef Life Survey data in general, that's a yes. Um, there's been a lot of papers written. So RLS started in 2000, at end of 2007, started 2008. And in 2014, there was um, the, the first data set was released publicly and published as a, just a data. As a, so it was citable and the citations for that um, are, are up over, uh, it's over a hundred um, on Google Scholar. Um, I'm just confirming now, but it's, uh, it's, um, it's 108 citations on Google Scholar for that, for the, just for the fish data published in 2014. Um, I think there's a, closer to 300 citations on Google Scholar if you look for Reef Life Survey next to each other. Um, so there's a lot of papers that are written um, by scientists all around the world using the RLS data. That, that's phenomenal really when you think about how many years it's been there available. Um, and obviously it forms the basis for a lot of our research at UTAS and we've got quite a, um, so you know, we're quite a collaborative network around the world, but at UTAS now we have uh, 
to AIC Future Fellows, uh, DECRA and um, a, a Laureate Competitive Research are all working with this as a sort of a key part of the, the research of just our group. Um, plus it supports research groups, you know, it contributes significantly to research groups in UNSW and um, some in WA um, and yeah, all over the place. So, uh, and uh, how many students are uh, probably, probably between or oh, including international PhD students, there's probably um, 20 or 25 um, postgraduate student projects that have been based or are based on reef life survey data as well. This is just the stuff we know about too. So yes, it gets a lot of extensive usage. Thanks, Rick. Um, Jackie, what are your thoughts on how the sea, sea dragons and seahorses are faring? And do you think that um, overfishing is a problem in the bay by recreational fishers? Yes, there's some uh, controversial questions. <laughs> uh, recreational fishing, I wouldn't have a clue, I'm afraid, in terms of whether it's a problem. I know there has been studies in the past, it would have been a long time before even reef life was around that, um, you know, for particular um, commercially important species, the um, entire recreational catch for things that are very, I don't know, popular things like King George Whiting and that sort of stuff, they would, um, you know, they had tonnage when you put all the recreational catch together that was similar to what the commercial catch would be for some sites. So I don't know that that's specifically Port Phillip Bay, but, you know, there's a, a lot of people like to recreationally fish and when you put one person catching a fish times many million you do have um have a large impact so yeah sustainable fishing is something we'd really like to see um in terms of seahorses and sea dragons we don't really pick uh, i don't think we've looked too much at the data they're pretty patchy in their distribution they love the piers and jetties and those sorts of things but we've um reef watch victoria does a lot of um more sort of observational type work and they're doing some work on sea dragons so hopefully some of um, the images that are being sent in there might give us a bit more data because there's not great data on seahorses and sea dragons generally yeah, they're cool. a little bit on the uh, Heidi side yeah for sure <laughs> thanks Jack Rick did you want to add anything else to that um, comment about recreational fishing uh, it's probably easier for me to say than for, for Jackie as part of the Victorian government. So um, I know that the, there's a policy to increase recreational fishing participation across Victoria. Um, and I, I just have to express a bit of concern there. I mean, it doesn't, we don't have a handle on what they're actually, what the recreational catch is for most species and pretty much anything that's large enough to spear around the whole built up part of the coastline does get speared at some stage. So, uh, I, I certainly from my discussions, you know, when, when you're gearing up to go for a dive and you're talking to someone there or when you're in the dive shop and, you know, I mean, there's some pretty big dive shops that are set up very much for spearing. Uh, and a lot of people out there who don't actually know exactly, you know, what's sustainable, what's even nice to eat and what's not, you know. So I think um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of re recreational fishing pressure that's really, it's a, it's a wild card for management and it is nationwide. I'm um, not saying that it's all unsustainable, but I think that it's just not, it's very difficult to manage because it's not reported very well. Um, and uh, so it's a big wild card. And I'm not sure that it's a good idea to, you know, my personal uh, personal view that's unrelated to the government or or UTAS or anyone is that it's a, it's, it seems um, hard to justify increasing recreational fishing participation on the basis of what's you know, what the system can handle. Sure, it's good for the economy, but I don't know that the information's there that the system can handle that increase. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Um, so we're running out of time. Um, just quickly, I've got one really quick question. Um, someone's asking that if, if they are, don't have dive gear, their personal dive gear, but they have the dive qualifications, can they still get involved? Definitely flick us an email. Um, we can definitely have a chat about that. I mean, it is definitely preferred that you have your own dive gear, especially an underwater camera, but, um, you know, we've got divers that do have to hire BCN regs and um, still come out and do survey. So just flick us an email and we'll have a chat. Um, great. So we're, we're just bang on time now. Um, just lastly, I just wanted to double check if any of our panellists have got any final comments to make before we wrap up. No? 
No, everyone's all good. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much um, to our big thanks to our panelists for joining us today. And once again, I'm not sure if you're on the line, Dan, but huge congrats to your award last night. Um, and yeah, we appreciate everyone for taking their time out of the day to come and join us today for our second webinar. Uh, we hope you found something interesting and please get in touch with us if you've got any further questions. Uh, and please share our Reef Life Explorer when it comes live next Friday, the 4th of December. <laughs> so thanks everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Tony. Keep up the great work, RLS. <laughs> see you, Dan.